I'd like to call the February 27th regular city council meeting to order. And will council member Buxton please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Council, Council Member Martinelli is absent tonight due to a family issue. Uh, is there a motion to excuse? So moved. Second. Motion was made by Deputy Mayor Mahoney, uh, seconded by Council Member Fangs. All those in favor, please raise your right hand and say aye. 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 Motion passes 6 0. Is there any correspondence? There are no correspondence, Mayor. Thank you. At this time, we will take comments from the public. Uh, for those who've signed up, when I call your name, please come to the podium, state your name and the city in which you live, and you'll have three minutes to speak. And it looks like we have Mr. Mac McGlynn. Hi, I'm Mac McGlynn from Des Moines, Washington. I live up on North Hill. Um, I'm here to comment on how transparent things are. Um, I see it a lot in the blogs and everything else. Um, so I want Mr. Harris to be very transparent. He promised that he was going to have all the strip malls filled with brand new businesses. Um, he promised that he was going to have the theater built. I'm not quite sure how he's going to do that. But anyhow, he has all these promises that I'm going to hold him to. Mr. Harris wanted to get rid of all of our employees here. Nobody was really uh, worth his salt or anything else. I have no idea who he was going to replace them with. Um, so I would like to hear from Mr. Harris as to who he has so far put in our strip malls or brought new businesses into Des Moines. Oh, and I will fact check you because I don't believe a word or your, any of your tall tales. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about is Des Moines is very proud of the police force, um, the way the council has acted, and we're very proud of the things that have been done in the past with this council. Um, so what the one thing that I would like to see is the council members to go on a voluntary drug test showing that no drugs are allowed in our city. I would like to see that if drugs are found on a council member, they put in seven days at our lovely holdings. If they are if any medical attention is given to them during that point in time, they be dismissed from the council. Thank you. Thank you. This takes us forward to board and committee reports, and we will start tonight with Councilmember Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. So, uh, <clears throat> A couple weeks ago, I attended the Sound Cities Association networking dinner, and we got to hear some regional leaders talk about our work coming ahead in the region in 2020. And uh, I just, my favorite quote of the night was from Mayor Dana Ralph, and off the top of my head, it says, "When you do something for me, without me, you do something to me." And I thought that was worth pondering. Uh, for a long time. Appreciated that little inspiration. And so that was a, and I attended that with uh, actually Councilmember Harris was there as well. So then uh, along with uh, Councilmember Honey and Councilmember Bangs, I attended a great little community event down at the quarter deck hearing about some of the history of the area and I think I'll let one of them give a little review on that. I also 
attended a farmer's market meeting uh, this week, and it's kind of exciting. They're, they're uh, rebranding themselves as a market. They've got a lot of fun activities, uh, some fun things prepared for all of us in the community this summer. And uh, they have borrowed some of the, the great police logo work to incorporate into their new logo on their new website. So with along with the rebranding, it includes a new website and some new features for the face of the market in town. So I'm excited to see all that. <clears throat> I also, uh, the city of Des Moines is part of a great partnership uh, for stimulating economic development in our in our community, we partner with five other cities and the Highland, and Highland College is called Soundside uh, Alliance for Economic Development. And so I attended that meeting this week and it was just a nice uh, recap of the history of that organization and how uh, in 1998 it was started, but they, with a regional partnership, it's nice to um, work together to bring in business, support business, create education, um, and educate staff and electeds around the region about how to draw in partners and business into our city. So it's a good collaboration. I appreciate being part of that organization. And in addition, they're a key part of supporting uh, the Small Business Development Center at Highland College. This, this organization was key in helping to create that, and which is one of the items on our agenda tonight, is, um, involves our support at the Small Business Development Center. So uh, this Soundside Alliance, which we don't hear very much about, has had a big part in just encouraging the economy in our city. So appreciate that organization. And then tonight, along with a few of my other colleagues, uh, we attended a ribbon cutting, and I think I'll let the mayor talk about that. So, <clears throat> part again. Well, as, so there's this great little business down next to the print place. I mean, I can, they're they're darling, a darling couple. Uh, she has it works at Wesley in the nursing staff, but. This is her other business they're just opening. It's called Aesthetic Specialist. They do all these cool things for your face and skin and give you massages. But we did a little ri ribbon cutting there right next door to the print place, which is uh, Dan and Cindy Johnson's place down there on 7th. And a great little turnout. And they're excited for their business to serve our community. And I hope they're going to come and talk. Sounds like maybe they're, they're going to come and talk to us a little bit about their new business in town, drawing to end that. Councilmember Mahoney, the mayor, Councilmember Banks was there. So great little, great little community event tonight. <clears throat> so moving on to the consent calendar, a couple of comments. Uh, number five, uh, an interfund loan. Just I, I'm always impressed with our staff and their creative ability to create savings. So this is just another example of that. Um, then number seven, what I mentioned, the Small Business Development Center, we're re-upping our uh, contract with them, and I'm, I am excited about that. I love that little organization out of the college. And on number eight, uh, just as a little reminder, we have already made a decision about this. This is the, um, the sales tax that this is not, it sounds a little bit like a new tax, but this is going to be credited back to us from the state. So there's no additional tax funds that are going to come from the public as a result of this decision. Just We've talked about it before, but just another clarification because it's on the consent, ag consent agenda tonight. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to oh, provide a little bit more color to that tax. Sure. So it's a, a minor percentage of sales tax that's collected from the city of Des Moines. And the sales tax um, is, is it, for Des Moines, it's about, I think, $30,000. And it's to help the homeless uh, or, or help with affordable housing. With $30,000 a year, it's very difficult to do anything that's extremely beneficial. So when we spoke about this before, as a reminder, it had to do with how could we work with our other cities around who get you know, varied collections, but it still doesn't work out to be a big number, but you put a lot of small numbers together and it's a big number. So, um, Councilmember Buxton was completely accurate and correct in saying it's not new. 
it's part of the sales tax, it's credited back to the city so we can help with affordable housing, teaming up with uh, communities around us to have something happen. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to provide that extra color, thank but you. thank you for bringing that forward. Uh, and then we go to Council Member Banks. Just to add a little more clarification. Okay. It is part of the South King Housing and, and you. you're welcome. And that's a, an organization that we signed on with that is comprised of nine cities in King County. We make the 10th city and we're, we'll be pooling our monies together because 30,000 doesn't do anything, but together collectively, should the this deci decision be made, it'd be a million dollars a year. So we can certainly do a lot for affordable housing uh, not necessarily just to build it, but to keep what currently is affordable, affordable. So that's just a bit of clarification. So I don't have a committee report. I haven't really gone out. Um, I did go to the aesthetics ribbon cutting, which was great. I attended the uh, Tales of Adventure from Old Military Road, which happened last Friday, I think it was, or two Fridays ago which was really great. It was narrated and, and, and uh, devised and uh, don't be modest. And <laughs> Steve Edmonston and <laughs> Scott Schaefer. So it really was well done. I think it was very, very enlightening because no matter what you read, I just love storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you do an excellent job at that. So there, there are a few more and, and um, that we did the crisis on the 20th, disgraceful scheme. I'm not sure what that's going to be, but that's March 25th, and then the drawbridge, which is April 16th, but you can go online and check that out. Now, what I'd like to do is take just a couple minutes because um, sometimes this month goes by without many people realizing that, yeah, taxes are due. We know that. Um, but it's also Black History Month, which I think is extremely important to recognize whether you celebrate it or not. Um, to recognize that it originated in 1926, founded by Carter G. Woodson, and it was created to celebrate African American achievements, births, important timelines and events, and to remember those that we lost. The entire month of February highlights the accomplishments of African Americans, and February, which a lot of people don't know, was chosen to coincide with Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln's birthdays. Uh, on every single day of Black History Month in February, a daily fact that occurred on the same day uh, in a past year of history is provided. You can go on, it's very rich. You can see lots of different, um, I mean people, it's not just Martin Luther King, it's not just uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, like today. Uh, John Menard became the first black to make a speech in Congress in 1869. And very little is known, but there were very, there were like, I think, 12 or 10 uh, African Americans that served in Congress back then. Think about it, right? So 1872, Charlotte E. Ray graduated from Howard University School of Law, became the first female admitted to the District of Columbia Bar. That's phenomenal. 1902, the first black soloist to perform at the White House, Marian Anderson, was born. In 1923, jazz saxophonist Dexter Gordon, if you haven't heard him, you better, was born. He passed away in 1990. He was phenomenal. 1964, black women's rights champion Anna Julia Cooper died. 1988, Debbie Thompson became the first black woman to win a Winter Olympic medal. These are things that sort of pass us through. You know, our daily lives are kind of crazy. But it's really important to understand the history and how all have contributed to what this country truly is, or hopefully will be better one day, but certainly was crazy back then. You know, relatives, family, once, twice, three times removed from my family, um, you know, made this country what it is today, along with, of course, many other cultures that came here. So one site that you can check out is workplacediversity.com, fabulous one. And don't forget, next month is Women's History Month. Thank you. That concludes my report, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Nutting. Um, I don't have anything this week. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Harris. 
Uh, I attended the SCA uh, event with uh, Council Member Buxton, and um, uh, I am fascinated with uh, SCA, Sand Cities Association, and uh, I am thrilled that she is so involved with it. Um, it is an association of all the uh, small cities around here, and uh, it is just great to see all the different cities working together and sharing their uh, issues and finding solutions. Um, I hope we do it as a city. We become even more engaged. Um, I also attended that day a Reach Out Des Moines uh, meeting, and I want to uh, also applaud our uh, CSO, Tanya Seabury. Um, she is doing a fabulous job with uh, the uh, new apartments, Waterland Crossing. Um, we are going to have uh, a couple of thousand new residents in the next couple of months, and she is doing a great job in uh, making sure that um, they have the services that they need to thrive. And um, that's just a really, really good thing. Um, the uh, the uh, majority of my time was again spent with uh, the, all of this port package stuff. And um, last Tuesday, the Port of Seattle Commission uh, approved in principle um, that they will provide updates to up to 5,000 port packages by 2026. Um, this is as uh, this is equivalent to the Cubs winning the World Series. Uh, it would have been simply impossible for something like that to happen even four or five years ago. So um, that's really a you know hopefully a big deal. I will not be here for the next meeting because I'll be in Washington D.C trying to, although they have committed to it in principle, um, they don't actually have the money to pay for it. Um, they count on federal grants to pay for these port packages, and the current federal code does not allow for updates. Never has. It, it was always a one-time payment. So um, they say that they will pay for these out of their own pockets, which translates into our property tax levy. I don't want that. Um, so my goal in going to DC is to find a way to get the code changed sometime soon so that the uh, federal government will kick in for these updates the way that they do for um, new Port packages. Um, the other thing I want to tamp down enthusiasm. You know, the port did 17, one seven new port packages last year. They have nothing like the proper infrastructure to do 5,000 or even 500 right now. So there are many, many challenges left in uh, making that a reality. But um, you know, it's. Uh, Certainly better than things were last year or a couple of years ago, and um, you know, we're we're hoping that uh, the devil is not in the details. Um, and uh, I think that uh, oh, um, one other thing yeah, regarding um, Dr. King. Um, Dr. King is like a huge deal in Ireland. Just it, it was almost impossible to hear his, write, his speeches and writings when I was a kid because they were copyrighted by his family. Um, and if you go to Time Magazine's website right now, for some reason they were able to get like permission to like redo, do this virtual reality of him giving some of his speeches and it's just extraordinary. I highly recommend it. Uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, real highlights, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Edmiston, I enjoyed your your uh, history. By the way, just to elaborate what it was about, was he, he goes about the history along Military um, Road, where the Grandview Dog Park is. It's not in our city, so I don't make it as important. I'm um, just kidding. But it, basically, there was a for former Ajax intercept missile site during the Cold War, and it was fascinating, the story behind that history. So a lot of people are running their dogs there, and they have no idea what it used to be. Um, and I look forward to your other events. I also attended skateboard. Um, the biggest thing that came out of that was of any importance to us was the status of 509. The key players um, 
that, that are been championing 509 and the Gateway Project for us. We basically gave them a vote of confidence that this is a priority when they realign due to the uh, 976 initiative, um, the reduction of funds. Um, it sounds like it's gonna make the top of the list, um, which is good for us because it'll actually get done. Usually the South Sound, some, one that kind of gets left out. Um, Destination Des Moines, I'm excited for, I went, attended their meeting. I am really uh, excited for some of the events coming up in the future. They have the Poverty Bay Wine Festival May, March um, 7th. Also, just the pre-planning for the fireworks as well as the Waterland weekend, the parade and so forth. Um, another exciting thing that I did recently, and I brought some community leaders together, and uh, Steve, tell Melody I'm working on Federal Way next. Um, but uh, I got the Mount Rainier coaching staff for boys, both boys and girls, and the biggest thing is has been the disconnects between the community. And, and there was some great um, networking there that I think is going to bring some positive change to start tying um, our schools with, back with our community. That's very important to me. Uh, Coach Mack is a phenomenal guy, was a football player for the Cincinnati, ba Cincinnati Bengals at one time, and a very humble man that uh, was really interested in the kids. He pays for things like field improvements out of his own pocket. So if you ever get the opportunity to meet him, make sure you do because he's well worth the time. And the only other thing I uh, wanted to add about the consent agenda that you didn't say it is, Beth Ann, nice work. Yeah. It's 6700 bucks you're saving us, but it's 6700 bucks you're saving us. And every every penny counts. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, before I jump into my items, um, you mentioned the Waterland weekend. The dates for that Waterland weekend are July July seventeenth through the nineteenth. Okay. I just like to do that so people get to hear when the dates are. Block your calendars, folks. Um, We're doing it right now. Do you want 4th of July? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was self-evident. Um, but, but thanks for the help. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Council, I've been working on uh, Council Committee assignments. I've got some fine-tuning and review to do. Um, uh, they will get emailed. Uh, my expectation is tomorrow. So that's the only update I have on that. Um, I have another item I wanted to talk to you about. Um, we agreed that this would show up on the uh, February agenda every year, um, and that has to do with the Stephen J. Underwood Memorial Scholarship. Um, many of the employees of this city have put into that scholarship over time, um, but as people change out and so forth, and we get farther and farther away from um, that, that point, um, sometimes the amounts dwindle, and so some of these individuals uh, do provide a, an additional amount, but again, you can't put the sole funding for this memorial scholarship on the backs of a few individuals. So what I would like to suggest is our, our Council Hearts and Minds Fund is currently at $5,309, just under $310. The scholarship fund is at this point is at a thousand dollars. If this if this council puts into it, we it, it helps to secure it for an additional time. And because our hearts and minds fund is as healthy as it is at this time, I would like to suggest that we give the staff the approval to transfer uh, another th another thousand one thousand dollars reducing our fund to 4,30993 dollars and putting that into the um, Stephen J. Underwood Memorial. It's money that goes to help students who can't afford or who are trying to afford, let's just say, higher education opportunities. So that's my pitch. I would open that. I, I recognize Council Member Metting. Uh, if that's a motion, I second that wholeheartedly. I'll make it a motion if you're going to second that. <laughs> um, Okay, so we have a motion on the table to transfer $1,000 from the Council's Hearts and Minds Fund. And by the way, the Hearts and Mind Fund is a fund that we put into as council members um, out of the per diem that we receive so we can address uh, the loss of a community member that has contributed. Uh, sometimes we provide 
um, flowers to those events or we provide input to other events that help build our community. So this is something that this council does. This is this uh, scholarship is very much in keeping with the philosophy behind the fund. So um, any other comments? Worthy cause. I'm sorry? Worthy cause. Thank you. So all those in favor of transferring $1,000 to the uh, Stephen J. Underwood Memorial Fund from the Council's Hearts and Mind Fund, please raise your right hand and say aye. 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 That passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Um, and I think also that this scholarship also represents, it's from the council that we're putting into it, but it represents our city supporting our kids. Uh, I think uh, Deputy Mayor Pony had a comment. Mayor, also, uh, I think it's... Uh, Prevalent that we recognize Tony Overmeyer, one of our recent losses, who contributed quite a bit to the community. Um, I think we take maybe 15 seconds of silence or something along those lines. As a yes, and, and I can also I'll also point out that um, that's a recent loss to our community. She uh, Tony was involved in our uh, pool district and shared it for a while. Um, unfortunately, uh, she recently passed. And um, the, that's a, another thing where the council, we don't always bring this stuff, this information to the dais. We oftentimes will recognize that something's happened and it could be two weeks before we have a meeting or something like that. So the uh, city clerk will reach out to us via email and we will give our approval to send some kind of acknowledgement forward. But in recognition of uh, the passing of Tony, I, I would, let's observe 15 minutes of silence, or 15 seconds of silence. Thank you. At this point, we'll go into our administration report, and I will turn the floor over to our city manager, Mike Mathias. Thank you, Mayor. Um, our report's a little lengthy tonight. We're going to try to um, do it as efficiently as possible. So to start with, I'd like to introduce um, Judge Leone to come to the podium. And as I'm always, I can't resist saying, Always better for you to appear before us. <laughs> Thank you. It's always a pleasure uh, to come and have the opportunity to address the council, especially um, on an evening like this where um, it, it is my pleasure to announce that um, this past fall, uh, our court administrator, Jennifer Johnson, uh, was awarded um, one of two awards, a uh, statewide award uh, from the District and Municipal Court Managers Association for uh, Court Administrator of the Year. And just to give you some sense of um, how, uh, what an accomplishment this is, there are, we were just trying to, to do the math here, but somewhere between 100 and 150 uh, courts of limited jurisdiction in the state of Washington. And so she was one of two that um, was chosen to be recognized. And just by way of background, she's been working with the court since she was 18 years old, um, started out in Yakima Valley, her hometown, and then moved to King County, um, started work for King County District Court. She's also worked for Kent Municipal Court. Um, we've been so fortunate here at the city to have her. You've been here now how many years? 21, 21 years here <laughs> with the city. And um, I just wanted to highlight a, a couple of her many accomplishments. Um, first of all, she's been um, instrumental in the development and launch of our um, DUI court and uh, could not have done it without her support and um, input. And that continues as our DUI court grows. Um, and that was quite an undertaking. So I personally thank you for that because we would not be as successful as we, as we are if it weren't for your effort. Um, also, as the council is aware, um, when the automa automated traffic safety cameras were installed, that increased the court's workload several thousand fold. And um, that ended up being an incredibly, incredibly seamless transition. We were able to take on that workload. And again, a lot of that was, uh, I'd say all of it was 
uh, Ms. Johnson working behind the scenes to make sure that we could hit the ground running once those lights went live. So that was a huge accomplishment. Um, and she's just a joy to work with. She manages uh, our growing court staff and um, always is supportive, a great coach to them, and um, always encourages them to um, get all the latest training uh, on all the issues that um, we deal with in our court. So um, she's a terrific leader, uh, and it's just a pleasure to work with her. So if you'll join me in congratulating her. Do you want to, I want to give you the opportunity sure. if you want to say sure. a few words. So I just have a, a few words to say. I was completely shocked um, when I found, it, found out um, about this. I actually was tricked um, by Justice Mads, or Justice um, Fairhurst and was told to go to a meeting. And uh, they did this presentation. It was myself and another Superior Court. And I have to be very honest with you, the other nominees are Phenomenal. So I felt very privileged to be um, awarded this position of, of court administrator because my colleagues, I mean, everybody works, we're all working up colleagues. And so um, I love my job, I love what I do. And, uh, you know, I appreciate everything that the council allows me to, to do and, and my forward thinking and, you know, hey, let me just try this. <laughs> let me run with it. And my judge always giving me that opportunity too. So thank you very much. I greatly, greatly appreciate you all. So I'd like to um, ask Susan if you'll come up to the, the podium. Um, yes, we, I, we have several new staff uh, people, and I wanted to, to introduce two of them to you. Um, and I'll just ask them to stand up when I um, call their name and tell uh, the council and the community a little about you. Um, first one is Eric Lang. And Eric um, is a planner in our community development department. We are extremely pleased to have him. Um, he's just fit in seamlessly. He's great with the customers. Um, he's just doing a tremendous job. He comes to us from the Tacoma Housing Authority where he was for eight years working on affordable housing issues. Um, he has a master's degree from UW Tacoma in community planning and he's also an adjunct instructor at um, Highline College uh, where his wife is a professor and a coordinator in the business department. Um, he's got two girls, very cute, they were in the other day. Um, they're three and one and a half and he is an avid sports fan, fan um, particularly with UW. So, thank you, Eric. <laughs> and the next person I'd like to introduce is Rochelle Sims. And many of you have already met Rochelle. Um, she was originally hired part-time as the victim's advocate, and now she's also um, helping us as a management analyst. Um, she studied at the Art Institute of Denver, and she's constantly in training to, um, to uh, increase her skills in better assisting crime victims. Um, some of the recent trainings, Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and also at Shoreline Community College, amongst, amongst others. Um, she works closely with the prosecuting attorney and police department in that role. Um, as management analyst, she's really jumped in there. As you know, Nicole Nord Nordholm is on maternity leave, and so there's been a lot of pieces that need uh, picking up, and Rochelle's helped us tremendously with that. She's um, taking over staffing the Human Services Committee. Um, she's also attending the Senior Services Advisory Committee. She's helping with uh, implementation of the Vets and Senior Services Levy Grant um, with the Senior Activity Center. Um, she also is attending the South King Housing and Homeless Partners work group and board meetings. And she is working right now on some grant applications and also doing the, the myriad of paperwork that comes along with our existing grants. So we really appreciate Rochelle. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, Council Brandon Carver, Public Works Director, and I'd like to have Ben Stryker stand up. He's our newest hire in uh, uh, Public Works Engineering. He actually works on the uh, uh, surface water engineering side of things. Ben comes to us from Indiana, uh, Purdue, um, graduate, uh, recent graduate uh, with a master's degree. Uh, and so we, he, he came out here because he likes the Northwest and wants to get, get to some kayaking and hiking and, and we'll overlook the Boilermaker part and make him a Husky <laughs> if we can. Uh, he's been here since uh, the first of the year. So uh, welcome, Ben. Ben. Mayor and Council, I think that, um, you know, it, we've focused so much on succession planning and making sure that we're safe over time. And for, you know, it's, it's just such a pleasing moment that we're able to attract in the quality of people that were just introduced. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I also want to acknowledge one person from our senior staff who's just done an incredible job for us. And, you know, every week I could introduce everybody because they all do an incredible job. But this person especially, I think, just stands out. AJ, if you would. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Adrian Johnson is our um, human resources director, and she has incredible number of qualities that are positive. Great sense of humor. She's incredibly detailed oriented. She understands her field of, of discipline with expertness. And she rarely disagrees with me. So because of that, <laughs> so, for, so for that, no. But we appreciate your efforts so much. Thank you. Please. And the council may have a comment as well. I, I just want to say um, I've had the pleasure of being around here for a little while. And the caliber of the staff that we get here is absolutely amazing. This is a fabulous team, and I just want to say how grateful I am to see the new members joining the team and making it even stronger than it was before. We're really pleased to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Oh, I was. Okay, so... I um, think uh, Councilman Banks has a comment. Oh, sorry. Well, actually, um, in, in the last five years that I've actually been on council, and even before then, um, we've seen the changes in the staff over the years, and I would say this is probably the most comfortable um, that me individually as a, as a council member can say that that comfort level comes from the professionalism that you all show and from the quality of the skills that you bring with you. And I think it takes time to get to know any organization that you come into. But I would not know that you were new. I really wouldn't. Uh, not that I work with you every day or did in the past, but it's really, it, it says a lot from your leadership team that you are here and you fit in and you've done well and you make us as council people look good. And so I really, really appreciate, you make Michael look good too, no matter what he says. So I really appreciate the leadership, and the leadership comes from bottom to top, top to bottom. It's not just at the top. So thank you, you all, all of you, all of you have done a great job. And I've seen many people like Peg move up and around and just do phenomenal jobs more than what they came in to do. They do more now. So thank you, and you're doing a lot for Michelle. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, I think Shannon. Perhaps <clears throat> we'll have an update on the coronavirus. Can I drive for me, Bonnie? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, with the ongoing emphasis of the coronavirus in the media today, um, we have gone ahead and been proactive, and we've loaded some information on our city website. So there at the top in news, we have our coronavirus disease 2019, which is COVID-19. And if you click on there, um, we have put some updated information about the city participating in conference calls, webinars, making sure that we've got all the latest and most up-to-date information on the virus and what is going on within our county, within our state, around the nation, and around the world. 
Um, we have links throughout the site that um, will give people information from county and state. Uh, we get updated information daily and weekly, and anything that is updated or changed, we will consistently update this page on our website. So if you get any questions from anybody within our community, you can refer them to the city website. They can click here and this is where we will house all of the updated information and make sure um, that it is correct, accurate, and gives the latest information. And Shannon, thank you. And if I may add, um, what we're doing is coordinating with um, King County Health Department, King County Emergency Operations Center, State Department of Health and um, staying current with what our partner cities are, what actions they're taking. Um, what we want to assure is that Des Moines is consistent with what is being done around us and integrated into that process. So we're not, we're trying to avoid independent action. We don't have the resources, we don't have the expertise, but there are others in our region that do, and so we're tapping into into that level of integration. And Shannon's done a great job of that. Thank you. Councilor Buxton, did you have? Yeah, I was just looking it up, but I'm sure you got this covered, but just wondering if the link with the cool picture and everything has been posted on all of our community pages. It was just finished a little while ago, so we will be doing that. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. You, you I did, if somebody, for time for shout outs, my opinion, Tara and Bonnie, you guys do a fabulous job in getting all this stuff to these community pages. I get notification, because I sign up for them all, right? I'll be once in a while, I'll sign in, and there's this huge list of all the community pages and, and the activities in the city that have been posted to all these pages. So thank you for <laughs> keeping up on that. And Shannon, I'd like to say, you've jumped into this emergency management thing, and, and it's, the, it's, a, it's been a seamless transition, and you've even, I think, you've even put a little bit of extra emphasis behind it, so nice work. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'd like to move now to have Beth Ann uh, do a finance update. And some of this information is in your, is in your packet, Council. I didn't, um, okay. part of the packet or do I bring it up? Um, I don't know if we need to bring it up. Um, it's part of the packet and what we've provided for you is a draft financial statements for um, revenues and expenditures for 2019. Um, as you know, we um, start the budgeting process usually we start a um, usually we start working on it March April May and then um, throughout the summer we work with departments and then we have the budget retreat in August and then in November we approve the budget so November 2018 we approve the 2019 budget and then throughout the year as things change we bring things to council and then in November we did a revised 2019 budget so the report that we've given includes that revised 2019 budget and we report out as part of what our plan was. We give you updates and this is our preliminary year to date. We're still working on finalizing um, the numbers for 2019, but this is our draft. Um, property taxes have, um, they're actually compared to 2018, they're 5.2 percent higher, and we've collected what we budgeted for. So, um, and which is good for the general fund. It's our largest um, tax revenue or largest source of revenue for the general fund. So we're in good shape there. Um, sales tax, the regular, is um, let's see, 22.2 percent of unrestricted tax revenue and we've seen an increase over 2019, or 2018, of 9.2%. So sales taxes are healthy and coming in. Um, on the next page, this is a chart that we provided. 
um, started providing, and it shows our industry categories um, with a comparative over four years. And as you can tell, um, that we're doing, we're seeing um, growth in our industries. Um, construction, one-time sales tax has um, grown over the last two, three years. That money is transferred out of the general fund to the one-time sales tax fund for construction. Then business and occupation taxes, those have increased and we've seen, actually we had a healthy growth from, 28, from in 2019 over 2018 of almost 20%. So um, franchise fees, actually we did not meet our revenue projections and some of that I believe we, the two franchise fees are for um, cable TV and for solid waste. Cable TV, as we know, people are not, um, for budget purposes, <laughs> it's discretionary. I believe people are streaming services and a lot of people aren't doing um, cable TV. Um, and so solid waste, um, I don't see that we've had a huge growth in um, population. It may change as we get some more units in but I know people are really being budget conscious and these are two areas that they really do conserve and recycle, which means revenues don't come in as high. So, um, Utility taxes, we, um, we're 2.3% less from prior year. We're still working on the utility tax audit. I believe we completed our first um, audit of uh, organization PSE. They're finalizing it and have sent the information in, so we don't have anything final yet, but I'm hoping to hear within the next two, three months and figuring out what the results of that are. And we should be getting um, preliminary estimates from the other, or the other um, businesses that they've sent out. Um, I didn't realize it would be as slow of a process as it has. <laughs> But I think when they request the data, it takes a lot longer to get it and analyze it. And then once they have the results, they need to send, send it back. And then there's, a, I believe, um, a period of time if they have concerns or whatnot. So they can appeal it or um, see if they agree with it. So I'm hoping um, before we start the budget process in May and June that we have something more definitive that we can report out. Your audit is referring to the audit of the business park, correct? Or is it beyond it's that? It's on the utility taxes. And Overall. one, all the utility taxes. Okay. Our concern was is that because of the zip code um, and the addressing being Seattle, we were concerned we weren't getting the business park. Um, the initial findings for, I believe it's electric and gas, is that PSE is capturing the business park, but they were taking a federal tax credit and they were excluding that from income. And that was why we weren't seeing an increase. So they're still working out the details on that. Thank you. But the other businesses, I'm not sure about that zip code. Excuse me. Um, so does your budgeting take into account people trying to save energy? In other words, you know, people are trying to save water and they're, you know, um, and they're trying to use less electricity. So I'm just wondering, you know, does that come into your calculations? In other words, as we try to use less of that stuff. Um, we do. We try to use trending data to assess that. Um, we're not always, I mean, the crystal ball isn't always as clear for us, but we do try to look at the trends and also look at weather patterns for gas and electric um, because if we have a really mild winter, revenues will be down. And you're right, people are trying to conserve. Um, I do know in water usage with water rates, as people conserve and try to um, use less, the costs have to get spread. So sometimes there's rate increases. So we do try to look at the providers and what those impacts would be when we do our trend analysis and forecasting. Beth Ann, if I may, mm -hmm. um, 
I think what's really important to remember is that, so Beth Ann's showing you a snapshot. This happens to be 2019 full year look. But at any, you know, one of the things that the strategies that we employed to get us solvent was to look at five year projections and trend. And you mentioned trend, and that's critical. But we're always evaluating what trend looks like relative to current time and future time and, and bringing that to council as it's, you know, appropriate. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, the next one is our red light running. And this is one of the ones that with the red light running cameras, there's been a change in behavior. And so as that behavior's changed, the revenues have gone down. And one thing we did is we had budgeted 2.1 million, our original budget for 2019. But we, as we continually monitor the revenue source, we realized that we weren't gonna get as much. And in the revised budget, we adjusted our estimate to 1.8 million. And we are just a little bit below that. So that's part of the conversation is constantly looking at the revenues and making sure that if they're not coming in, that we do something early in the year for a course correction to make sure we don't get into trouble. So. Then we have our CIP funding sources, um, real estate excise tax. Um, we've been very lucky in 2018 and 2019 to have some large commercial properties actually sell. So uh, we are over our projections in 2019, but we are actually lower, um, we're 6.5% lower from 2018. But um, looking at 2017, 2018, and 2019, we've actually um, really experienced some very high commercial sales. So we've been lucky that way um, and put that toward our capital improvements. And then also the amount we adjusted up in our budget estimates in 2019 for one-time sales and B&O &no taxes. And that is um, 113.6% 100, higher than, or 13.6% higher than, no, it's 113.6% higher than 2018. So, which is good. Then um, the next one on the general fund, this gives a total snapshot of revenues, our revised budget to our actuals. And originally we budgeted 4.5 million Indian fund balance, which is above that 16.67% um, fund balance reserve. And Right now, we are at 22.2%. I do know that there's some expenditures that will hit this that will lower that a bit, but we are actually, um, we got more money in than we expected and we spent less, which is good. And then our special revenue fund, the development fee, or yeah, the development fund, the same thing, we budgeted, sorry, the next one, we budgeted three for an ending fund balance of 3.8 million, and right now we have 4.259 million. So we actually got a little bit more revenue in, and we're a little underspent. Um, these charts are to show the beginning fund balance, revenues, expenditures, and ending fund balance of all the funds. So this is really our fund accounting. Um, we just kind of take a look at that. Um, the next, keep going, probably the next notable is our marina fund. And we are a little bit higher on our revenues than what we budgeted, and we're underspent on our expenditures. So our working capital has actually increased from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, so as an enterprise fund, they're um, financially solvent. And then the next one is surface water management fund. 
it's also in the same position where it's brought in more revenue than we anticipated. It's a little bit underspent and we've increased our working capital. And so the money that's in these two enterprise funds, they go towards maintenance and operations and capital needs for the funds in future years. So, and then we report out on our deposits and investment portfolio. And our beginning at the beginning of the year was 40 million. And at the end of the year, it's 43.8 million. And that gives you the composition of our investments. What's in our checking account is at Key Bank. Um, we use the local government investment pool with the state of Washington. And then we buy investment instru instruments. So that is. Ann, could you go back to page nine? I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask probably a very, very uh, okay. basic question. Um, no, well, it says, I don't know, it says nine on the monthly financial. I guess it's page 13 of the packets. Page 13. It's the, you know, budget and versus actual revenue and transfers in by fund, so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you know you've pretty much nailed all of the um, uh, your forecasts on these, um, except for the capital improvement. So I mean, I'm assuming there's an obvious answer as to why those are you know around 50 percent and so on. Um, Some of that is when we do capital improvement, um, we do our best guess and we work with Public Works, but due to construction schedules or um, timing of the projects, they get delayed. And so that's why we budget for the project of what we think we're going to spend. And I believe some of that in the capital, municipal capital, was the North Bulkhead. But we've had a delay on the permit. So we wanted to have the appropriation for the project. But because of the delay, it's not spent in this year. So we'll request that to roll over to 2020. Just to add a little bit more detail to that as well, one of the things we have to do in our capital budget planning, uh, a lot of the uh, projects are grant dependent, so we anticipate getting a grant, and so the allocation for the project is within the budget, but if we don't get the grant, we don't do the project. So that's why you see um, it appears that the capital budget is underspent by, by so much because some of those grants didn't come in, so we didn't do the projects. That's another factor. To, to add into the difference. Okay, so they're, you know, just some of these funds basically, they're just unknowable as to, you know, when you, you, you can't, you can't forecast them accurately. I mean, sometimes. I wouldn't say that. I would say just that uh, we're, we're planning uh, to our best guess on when the, uh, we anticipate getting those grants, but we're not the decision makers on those grants coming in. And so we compete for those grants. We anticipate getting the award, if the project isn't in the CIP, we're not going to get the award because they want to know that you have the, the, the match requirements to um, build that project if they, were, if they award it. So it has to be in the, in the capital budget uh, to be part of the com co competitive process. Okay, but, but there is a reasonable certainty that eventually these projects will uh, I mean, that you will hit 100% with these, or they might fall off, or I'm just... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As he says with certainty. Uh, <laughs> um, we have uh, Councilmember Bangs. Just a, a point of clarification. Under your industry category, remind me what non-classifiable establishments are. Is that the last one? That would be number... Uh, <clears throat> Guess page six. Yeah. Packet. In the packet, packet sorry. Page. In the packet, page six. That's actually a category that the state of Washington gives us, and it's called a statewide pool. It's a line item, and it says statewide pool, and it's what I believe Department of Revenue puts into this non classified. So. Hiding? No. <laughs> I don't want to give the money back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other council questions? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Beth Ann. Um, now I'd like to ask Deanna if you would introduce the Federal Way Link Extension presentation for Sound Transit. Good evening, Council. Uh, Dan Brewer, Chief Operations Officer. It's my pleasure tonight to give you an update of the Federal Way Link Extension Project. We've got a, a number of staff here tonight. Uh, Dan Abernathy had hoped to be here. Um, he's not feeling well and it's home ill. So um, tonight we have uh, Robert Nichols from Sound Transit, who's going to present. Eric Nelson from Kiwit, um, who will say a few words. We also have Dana Wilk. Uh, Katie Drool from Sound Transit and Peggy Willeen, uh, who's assisting quite a bit with me on the project. Actually, she's doing a lot for me. So, anyway, um, just very, very uh, quickly, we've come a long way. And when I uh, first started working on this project, it was about 2008. Uh, about 12 years now, we've been working on this in various stages of planning. Um, in 2008, the voters approved uh, the extension of light rail to the college as part of ST2 funding. Eventually, with ST3, that construction funding was extended to get uh, light rail down to the Federal Way uh, Commons Mall area by the transit center there. In 2017, we completed uh, a, a lengthy environmental process on the project. Uh, we had um, spent a number of years working with Sound Transit and other agencies on our um, FEIS, and uh, that was approved by FTA and FHWA in 2017. In 2018 and 2019, we entered kind of the procurement phase uh, with Sound Transit. Um, we had three great proposals, and uh, they selected a great team, Kiwit, to build this project. Uh, limited notice to proceed was issued to Kiwit um, last June, and um, we've, they've made just a tremendous amount of progress in the last uh, eight months on the, on the design of the project. Right now we have four primary working agreements that the staff is working on under the council's direction. Um, we have um, a city services agreement with Sound Transit where um, the agreement of, of the timing of payments for the work that uh, city staff is doing on the project. We have our development agreement, which is kind of the master agreement um, that we spent about 18 months negotiating and developing with Sound Transit. and. Um, there's a number of uh, issues that are in that agreement. I'm going to touch on a few of them and show you uh, the progress we've made so far. We also have the transit way agreement with Sound Transit that gives them the rights to, to have a, a transit way through our city and, and over and under some of our rights of ways. And finally, we have our interlocal agreement uh, with Highline College for construction of improvements in infrastructure on their campus. Some of the things that are in the development agreement that were noted uh, policy related uh, concerns for the council and the community were uh, environmental related uh, noise impacts, um, landscape buffers, mitigation for uh, tree removal. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with the cooperative uh, nature uh, between Kiwit and Sound Transit uh, mm -hmm. to fulfill um, the agreements that we've had in the development agreement. We've made good progress on that. Sound Transit's made a lot of progress on the, the right-of-way or the property acquisition at this point. Um, in kind of round, rough numbers, um, they've acquired or have agreements on about 70% of the properties that are needed in Des Moines. There's 30% that are still in negotiation or in condemnation proceedings at this point. And uh, that's going uh, fairly smoothly at this point. But we've made a lot of good progress on our 216th undercrossing and, um, and as well as the college way improvements. 
Our team is uh, well coordinated with uh, Kiwit. We're co-located with them down in the Federal Way office, um, located just uh, south of 320th, and we're able to uh, quickly respond to our other uh, agencies that we work with, City of SeaTac and Kent primarily, Federal Way is there as well, um, so, uh, as well as the college. Uh, college has been able to participate and provide input on the design as it's been moving forward, so all of that's going very well. Um, I'm really excited that we've reached this milestone. The construction on the project has started. Um, we've had four property, four homes, uh, have been demolished already in Des Moines, and you'll see uh, what's planned uh, in the coming weeks here soon. So at this point, I want to have uh, Bob Nichols come up and, from Sound Transit and kind of walk you through what they're, what they're working on. So. Thank you, Dan. Um, my name is Bob Nichols. I'm the acting uh, project director. Dan Abernathy would have been here, but he's not able to attend tonight. So uh, hopefully I will not disappoint you in my presentation. But uh, we have you know, great staff. We've had excellent involvement with city staff and the citizens of your community. And we've had Eric Nelson, will speak a little bit later, spoke in more detail. And uh, our government relations and our admin people are here as well. Uh, we have had a long history of working with your community, and we continue uh, to do so as we go forward. A short advertisement almost for Sound Transit, but let me see if I can run this thing. Just basically, we are in our system expansion phase. We have a number of segments extending both north, east, and south. And of course, one of the most important uh, segments is our uh, Federal Way link extension. And we have other activities taking place, but we are very excited to be working on the Federal Way Link Extension. And as you've probably heard in previous presentations, with 7.8 miles, we've got three stations, three garages, and we're excited to have 36,000 daily riders. It's a big part of how we're going to help move the community. Um, we think a lot of our citizens here will be using the Kent Des Moines station. So we have up there, of the three stations, our station crossing 236th. Uh, we've got a parking garage, we've got a new street grid, there's a plaza. And we're seeing images from early on, but our final design is underway. We're advancing it. The team is uh, advancing and consistent with the requirements, our directions, and input we've, rece we've received from the community. Again, an early planning concept diagrams, but we can see it's an elevated station. It'll be a marker in the area. It's a link to the High Line College. Uh, improvements in the area, opportunities for future development to help uh, um, intensify activities there and bring uh, activities to the area. We've worked closely with the city and the college in terms of roundabouts, in terms of uh, cul-de-sacs, in terms of access in. Uh, city staff has been very helpful in uh, helping us get there. You know, we're in the planning stages, and really where we're at, we're about 60% design on this station. Uh, it's actually one of the first stations to advance this far, and it's really quite exciting to see it come together. We have an excellent design team. They're continuing the concepts that were developed and will be shared with the city as the design advances. Visualization of the platform, the center platform station, canopies, windscreens, uh, safety rail, uh, it's just going to be a nice environment for the patrons. Existing condition along I-5, basically that's what's there now. Soon, by December 24, we will have light rail running. Likewise, an existing condition in Midway Park, an open area, soon a train. And we'll see that, that we have landscaping, uh, community concern of noise, sound walls, all be part of the design solution and make it an attractive uh, addition to the community. Where are we? You know, Dan gave a really great uh, overall view of what has happened, how we've moved the project forward, how everyone has contributed to it, and the length of time it takes to deliver these projects. Right now, we are in the design phase. We're crossing from 219 to 220. Uh, we're beginning our final design of the project. It's come after a long time of working with the community and our PE and our EIS. 
we're looking forward to more construction activity. We have early construction activities taking place now, much more to come. And again, we're targeting December 2024 for the start of revenue service. We work with the community over time. Uh, we've listened to what uh, the community is interested in and how it's going to impact them in terms of sound walls. We know that is a sensitive issue to the community. We've engaged in what were the citizens most interested in in terms of visual characteristics, and we've put that into our specs. So as the final design is developed, we'll have sound walls that are consistent with the community's expectations. Vegetation, we've heard that a dense evergreen is interested. So again, we've shaped the design requirements so that as the final design continues, the community will see what they've been expecting. There'll be no surprises. Again, we're using the mitigation along the edge, uh, along the easterly edge of the community. And again, this is from early planning, but it's basically how to use the vegetation to buffer and shelter the community. And just extending on through the edge of the community. Coming on down, again, utilizing trees, introducing trees. And at this point, I would like to turn over to Eric Nelson. And I didn't mean to hit that slide because that's a pretty good slide for him to talk to. And uh, I, I have just one question yes, for you, Bob. Um, sorry, Mayor, I'm trying, no, to, that's okay. trying to get I, you over there. I was enthralled with the presentation. I, I was too. So over at Angle, the Angle Lake Station, mm -hmm. In comparison, you're saying there's going to be 500 parking <coughs> stall All capabilities that, for the yeah. What what is what is the parking at Angle Lake? I'm going to see if any of my other team members. I'm going to guess it's 1100. We both. That's 1100. Yeah. You need to double that. <laughs> really? Yeah. It quite it, it is 500. <laughs> is what you're going to have down there? <coughs> That's going to be tight. Anyway, just yeah. wondered. Okay, go ahead, Councilmember Harris. Um, so yeah, I just just um, keying off uh, Councilmember Banks. What I was told by the SeaTac uh, City Council was, whatever they tell you for parking capacity, triple it. So I mean, this is a serious question: Is there still an opportunity to increase that, either vertically or you know, horizontally? The the footprint of the garage is constrained with. Uh, stormwater detention, as well as the street grid and available property. Uh, whether or not is it the interest to uh, increase additional um, storage or car parking elsewhere. One of the concerns we do have to work with then is it was in the EIS, and off the top of my head, I do not know what that specified and what the limits were. That would be the sensitive issue if there was interest in going larger in terms of not only just the budget, but just in other words, were the boundary conditions that we may or may not do. So that would probably require a little bit of review if you know, if there was a need, but really what are our constraints under our EIS? I, I, I just have a real quick sure, second like question. It, since it's a design with, with a noise wall, you won't know if it worked until the thing is actually running, right? So is, I mean, is there some, is there some metric for defining noise reduction success? And, and, and if, you know, there are complaints from the public, is there anything in your budget to come back and, um, you know, there, top it up if it's right. uh, there, not. There's nothing in the budget, but, but let's address in this terms of it is a science, it is engineering, uh, it is a precise measurement. In other words, what we, Sound Transit, have done is been able to provide to our design build team who's doing the noise analysis reasonably recent and accurate noise generation by the train. That's the start of the noise. So we have current information as opposed to earlier information, so it's very accurate. That's the base point for all of this taking place. The methodology for sound reduction is basically you're trying to mitigate at the source, buffer, some of it's as simple as sight lines. Okay, so through that exercise, uh, you identify what the heights are, and that's driven by how close you are to the wall, et cetera. Uh, so I think one of the keys for success is having good source data going into it. In terms of a budget for changes, I don't know if we actually have one for that. We're expecting to get it right the first time. We are addressing the walls. We're also addressing we have an obligation uh, to mitigate noise that we generate. And I'm stating that. It's got two-part question. So let me first state that we will mitigate the noise that you know, the Federal Way Link Extension generates through our noise analysis and the walls we build and any other sound mitigation strategies. 
We are also going to be mitigating for noise generated by the 509. Okay, we're going to be working with WashDOT to make sure that the noise that is not our generation, but caused by others, WashDOT, we will mitigate in our uh, wall design or other mitigation measures, which could be ballast mats. There's other ways of achieving sound reduction such that the community is um, whole in that sense. So you feel it's predictive? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Yeah, I was just going to add the fact that uh, be the, between the 509 um, partnership there, I was just wondering if that was affected by the 976. I know you guys were working on something and you were, I think you were talking about raising wall heights and shared costs and so forth. Is that still a go as far as you know? We have a number of things interwoven with WashDOT. Uh, what, regardless of the timeline for the 509 project, which does have a new timeline as of recently due to uh, events, uh, we've done a couple of things that really doesn't matter what they do in this, or their timeline for performance. We have an agreement with WashDOT to address the additional mitigation that we are going to perform to take care of the 509 impacts. Likewise, we've designed certain walls uh, expecting the 509 to be there. If it's not there, it really doesn't matter, but we're going to be ahead of it and it will be in place so there's not an impact later on. So the delay in the 509 project is really not impacting us. Great. I, I, and I was also understanding that not only the light rail and 509, you took into account the I-5 noise as well, so there should be a significant reduction for our residents up there. Uh, that all has been planned in and engineered, correct? That is correct. It, it, um, a couple quick other questions. One emphasis that we work with Metro for our east-west transportation to our light rail stations for the parking problem because that probably would help quite a bit, but I, agree, I can't agree with my colleagues here. I think 500 is way too small. Um, being a personal parker at the Angle Lake, it's if you're not there by seven, you don't have a chance. Um, and um, the last one was, and it's really a Kent question because it's in Kent, but those two vacant spots that are, that are um, next to 99, that would be between um, the light rail station. What what's in place for those? Is it is it mixed use uh, affordable housing or is it future parking lots? I don't know the site off the top. Of so the if you place. if you go to the one slide, thank you. Very good. Okay. Basically, where we you know Sound Transit's position is, we are acquired the property we need to construct our facility. Correct. Okay. And then at that point. When we no longer need it for construction, it will be disposed. In other words, it's surplus property to us. We don't have, and I guess I'd better refer to government people on how to answer this next part of the disposal of that property. Katie, can you address any constraints we may have from a board yeah, member? I'll let Dan go first. <laughs> the, 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 just keeping it high level and simple, those will be developed as TOD, transit oriented development parcels. Okay. Uh, in the city of Ken, and I know that they're already working with Sound Tran the Sound Transit TOD team um, on those yeah. plans, but that would be after construction when the, the, those properties aren't needed anymore for construction access. So, In, in a quick comment to that effect, um, so we had a discussion um, with Jordan Rash, who was the representative for Forterra that facilitated the Van Gaskin purchase, who has now gone to Sound Transit to focus on transit-oriented development. So we're absolutely excited about that relationship and looking at um, what the potential in the future is. Even though that's can't, there's certainly things that Des Moines can be doing to support that type of development as well. Thank you. Eric. Okay, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for allowing us to come here and present to you tonight. Um, as Dan said, there's been a lot of work done a lot of hard work, um, a lot of great collaboration. It's been uh, a pleasure working with Dan and Peggy and uh, Sound Transit and all the other AHJs uh, in our co-located office uh, down in, in Federal Way. I think that's been instrumental uh, to uh, the project so far. Um, so my, my name is Eric Nelson. I'm the, the project manager for uh, Kiwit, and Kiwit is the design build contractor that uh, Sound Transit elected on a, a best value basis uh, to do this project, to design it, uh, to complete the design, 
and then uh, go out and build it. And I thought it'd uh, be worth just taking a few minutes here to explain who Kiewit is, because I suspect many uh, folks have never even heard of Kiewit before. Um, and knowing that uh, we're gonna be doing this, this large project through your, your city and other cities, um, I wanna uh, hopefully gain your confidence that uh, we are certainly well qualified and up for this challenge. Um, so back in 1884 uh, was when Kiewit as a company was established. It was uh, established by a uh, Dutch immigrant um, named Peter Kiewit, and he was a bricklayer in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, building out a lot of the, the brick buildings there, and he decided that uh, he could do that work um, as a company himself, so he established uh, Peter Kiewit Company. Um, it was uh, a family-owned company for two generations. Uh, the last uh, Kiewit uh, uh, owner of the company was also named Peter Kiewit, um, and upon his death in 1979, he turned over the ownership of the company to the employees. So Kiewit is uh, a very broad-based employee-owned company. It's one of the largest designers, uh, design and, or engineering and contracting firms in, the, in North America. We do over $10 billion of revenue of work. Uh, we have over 10,000 uh, staff employees and then tens of thousands of craft employees that we employ in our projects. Um, so we've been around uh, a long time. We've got a long history and we're very proud of that. Here in the state of Washington, uh, we've been here uh, over 75 years. Um, some of the recent and, and more prominent projects that we've done here, uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, the, the new Tacoma Narrows Bridge that was completed in two, 2007, that was uh, a Kiewit project that we designed and constructed. Um, one of the early projects here in the state of Washington was uh, the Fort Lewis Barracks, where we had a contract with the U.S. government to build out uh, Fort Lewis, all in, all in uh, uh, part of the, the ramp up for the war effort. Uh, moving more recently, we, we, uh, this is another design build project we did. Uh, and we completed that in 2017, the new SR520 floating bridge and landings project. And then uh, relevant to sound transit, we've got a lot of uh, light rail transit experience across North America and here in, in the Seattle area is no different. Uh, we've done several projects with sound transit before, um, including a maintenance facility that was back in the, the early to mid 2000s. Uh, we're just completing the Bellevue to Redmond East Link project, that's E360. Um, that's a project very similar to Federal Way in terms of the scope, uh, going through the cities of Bellevue and Redmond, working with uh, the Washington DOT. Um, it's a smaller, smaller scale, it's roughly two miles of alignment versus uh, the Federal Way link extension is, is almost eight miles. Uh, we're also doing the I-90 Seattle to Bellevue uh, sound transit project, so across the I-90 floating bridge, uh, the work that's going on right now down in the International District Station, that's part of this project. And then the Northgate to Linwood project, we're also involved in that one. So uh, the work, let's talk a little bit about the work. Um, as Dan, Dan said, uh, construction has started. Uh, I will remind everybody, uh, this, this is being a design-build project. Um, it allows us to uh, have an accelerated schedule, so we're still continuing to design some elements of the project, but the elements that we get done designing earlier, we're able to go out and start construction. So uh, some of the work that we've done today out in the field that maybe you've noticed, uh, the geotechnical investigations, that's where we have small drill, drill rigs and equipment out there where we uh, test the soil, we take samples of the soil, and we use that information um, in developing our design to make sure we uh, adequately um, uh, take into account the different soils that are across the alignment. Structure demolition, um, we've started uh, uh, demolitions of, of properties. Um, we've 
done a few here in the city of Des Moines, quite a few in Kent. Uh, there's going to be a lot more of that coming up uh, this spring and into the summer. Utility relocations, and then the real visible work, um, the clearing and grading, um, and tree removal. You know, that's always something that we're everybody's very interested in, and and is a, a, a point of interest that'll start uh, in the summer of this year. And then the the light rail construction itself uh, won't really start until later this year in the fall, where you'll start to see some elements of. Uh, the guideway itself being constructed. Uh, our work hours, um, you know, we don't uh, we don't like working more than 40 hours a week any more than anybody else, and so um, our our work hours and and the way we bid this project is essentially a, a 50 hour work week, where we uh, will start at 7 a.m. and hopefully we'll be done with our our daily work by uh, 4 or 4.30 every day. Um, there are going to be times uh, just because of the nature of the work that we've got to work uh, at night or over the weekend. Uh, for example, where we're crossing uh, city streets, we've got to erect some of the concrete bridge structure across the street. We can't do that while the street is still open to live traffic. So we do that at night. Uh, to minimize the inconvenience to the traveling public where we can close the street, set up detours, um, and, and do the work safely. Um, there is a construction hotline that uh, Sound Transit has, a, has established for the public to call um, if there's any uh, uh, issues that they might have, questions, concerns about noise, lighting, and this is a 24-hour service um, that uh, we will get uh, that information to us immediately and we can react uh, to whatever the issue may be and correct it. Um, I realize this isn't in Des Moines, uh, but uh, Sound Transit asked me to put this slide in simply because it's, I think it's a significant event that's coming up fairly soon. Uh, the the Star Lake, Star Lake pro, uh, Park and Ride, uh, that's going to be closing uh, later this month, the third week in, in March. Um, and, uh, you know, there's quite a few folks that, that use that parking ride, uh, the alternate parking ride that's going to be in place during the closure is the Redondo Heights. And Bob, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but um, thought it was noteworthy just for everybody uh, to, to realize that. Okay, more specific to here in, in uh, Des Moines, um, we have started uh, the, some of the building demolition, like I mentioned, um, uh, but here starting uh, later this month, uh, if you can see that's 216th, is this a laser pointer? Yeah, that's 216th here. Um, that's, by the way, that's where the, the, the uh, 216th undercrossing is. That's actually going to be a a uh, small little tunnel where we uh, will go underneath 216th. Uh, that'll, that work will be done in a uh, long weekend closure. Um, that isn't until uh, 2021 where that work occurs. Uh, the, the properties with a red dot on it, those are within the, the construction limits and the construction right of way, properties that we have to demolish in order to make way for uh, the aerial or the guideway uh, itself. So we will start, like I said, later this month uh, on the north end here, just off 216th, and generally work our way to the south. And I say generally because a lot of this is dependent on uh, when Sound Transit acquires the properties and when they uh, turn over possession to, to us, so then we can go out and, and do the demolition. Yes. These two? Yeah. Uh, you can see right here this this line right here. That's where the uh, the guideway is going to be in its permanent condition. Excuse me. If if I mean. Your presentation. Normally, we don't take um, 
questions from the audience, but if they do ask it, you have to repeat the question in the microphone so people, so the, it's on the record and people from home okay. can hear it. Sorry. So the question was how close is the guideway to the properties? Uh, I don't have a scale on this slide, but I would suspect that it's, uh, it, it looks like it would be about that. I, do, I don't know the exact dimension. Excuse me, uh, Council Member Harris, you have to have your microphone on. Yeah, no, I press the button. Thank you. Um, so to what extent will the trees be uh, cut down uh, to the east of the guideway? Will all of those go away? Uh, most all of them, and, and we are really uh, restricted by the requirements that uh, Sound Transit has in, in terms of safety, uh, the type of trees that can remain, the proximity, how close they can be to uh, a, an active uh, rail system. So um, our, our, like I said, our uh, construction right away um, calls for each of these parcels with a red dot to be demolished. And so more than likely, uh, there a high percentage of these trees in here will all need to be removed. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Council Member Harris, one of the things on the east side of that line, of course, is going to be the 509. And then on the west side will be sound barrier with replanting of trees and so forth for aesthetics and noise abatement as well. Yeah, I can, uh, just based on the discussion that was earlier about the noise walls, I can tell you that, uh, yes, we did uh, in our design accommodate for the the noise from the future 509 expansion as well as uh, I-5. Uh, so uh, that alone added about 40,000 square feet of noise wall to the project. Okay, this is, uh, we're moving our way down south. Uh, the, the properties that we have demolished so far in Des Moines uh, are right in here. There's uh, two or three properties that Sound Transit was able to turn over to us. And uh, essentially, you know, as soon as we get these properties turned over to us, we want to, there's a series of, of sequence of events that has to happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, our interest is uh, to get them demolished. I know a lot of them uh, are, are nuisance properties. Um, this is the, the King's, King Arms property right there, just as a point of reference. Okay, that's all I had, so back to Bob. Eric, thank you. Uh, yeah, this, is, this gets to be my slide, and again, if there's any specific questions, uh, please you know, ask them of Sound Transit. We have ways of getting to us. Jefferson Rose is the person. If you'd like to talk to people, uh, we are repeating here the construction hotline number, so if something comes up that's of concern, it can be reported immediately, we can react to it. Uh, we have... Uh, to sign up for emails. Again, Jefferson and his staff spend a lot of time in the community. Uh, he's very amicable and he's very knowledgeable. And what he doesn't know, he comes back to us and asks the question. So rather than answering questions on the fly, I would suggest that you know the questions be asked perhaps of Jefferson and we can find out any piece of information that may, may be of interest to you further. I'd also like to take a moment to kind of congratulate uh, basically Kiewit, because Eric touched upon the 216th undercrossing. In our PE design, um, what had been intended for that construction condition would have caused probably a, f a great deal of disruption to the community. Uh, what the Kiwa team was able to do is generate a new and better, basically a better final design solution for that condition to minimize impact to the community. So I just would like to kind of give them a shout out that uh, what they were able to do as having the construction expertise, the design expertise, and being engaged in this. So. That was just sort of my plug for them because I can see that kind of uh, technology, that kind of expertise solving problems that help the community. So thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick question. Do, do we have those slides here at the city? Yes. 
Is it possible to put that, that last communication slide somewhere on our website so people can get to that? Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, just a couple of things. Um, the, you know, it's a phenomenal amount of work that's involved in all of this and coordination, design, everything that's happening. But I just, a little bit behind the scenes, I mean, I have to compliment Dan and Peggy for just doing an incredible job. Um, Brandon as well. Um, this involves community development, it involves communications, it involves coordination with, within the community. Um, and I think Sound Transit, you guys have just done a phenomenal job from what I hear and see. I think also uh, Councilmember Mahoney, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, relative to skateboard and staying on top of that. It's just been a great effort, coordinated effort. We really appreciate your attention to things that we care about. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on to the last item. Um, do you want to bring up the? I want I want to provide counsel, and um, I thought this would be more extensive, but given the the agenda we have tonight, I'm gonna keep this extremely brief. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you an update on aviation issues, specifically relative to the SeaTac um, stakeholder roundtable, and. What I'm anticipate doing is just walking through a couple of slides with information as to what's been occurring, and then bringing back to you on March 12th um, a more substantive discussion about the appropriate um, role of the city relative to START. So um, in July of 2019, the Port Commission um, passed design work for a number of projects associated with the Sustainable Airport Master Plan Unfortunately, it was done in Kirkland at a, at a remote meeting by the Port Commission. There was little, if any, notice to the cities that this was occurring. And um, once again, it was associated with the Sustainable Airport Master Plan, and, and the Port decided they would not, that they would take the risk that the environmental impacts of these projects would not be significant, and therefore they would be able to, to proceed with these. Um, the cities of Burien, Federal Way, Des Moines took objection to this. And uh, basically what we did was temporarily suspend participation in the start. And even though I think what's important to remember is that this issue was associated with the Sustainable Airport Master Plan, the recourse that we had was to, to say, wait a minute, what are we doing? And how collaborative is this? And what's the basis of trust? And these are things that you've told us and we have on record that they would not move forward with the Sustainable Airport Master Plan without appropriate environmental review. And in fact, that raised a larger issue that was central to our comments on the scoping of the environmental impacts of the SAM, Sustainable Airport Master Plan, that they were dividing the projects up and they were not looking at cumulative impacts, which we believe is state law under SEPA. So we had, we had issues with this. Um, Next, please. So what happened was that um, we temporarily suspended participation with the direction of the council. And in September of 2019, cities of Burien, Des Moines, Federal Way, and a few others um, held a joint aviation advisory committee to kind of coordinate our efforts and see where we were relative to, to the start. <clears throat> And in November, we did a follow-up joint meeting was held, identified outstanding issues associated with the start that could be the basis of a discussion with the port. Um, the city council at that time um, directed through a motion the mayor and myself to negotiate with the airport um, and engage in a discussion about what the future of start might be and the role the city would play in that, if any. In December, um, had a meeting with the port. Um, President Bowman from the Port Commission, um, Commissioner Calkins, um, the Executive Director Steve Metrick, um, Lance, the Director of Aviation, and a number of mayors, Mayor Farrell, Mayor Pina, Mayor, Mayor Mata, and City Managers Brian Wilson and myself, attended that meeting and had a very frank discussion about our issues. And the port, you know, was somewhat conciliatory as to the process they had followed in July. Um, but we expressed our concerns with very frank discussion. 
And then a follow-up meeting was held in January of 2020 as a follow-up to that meeting between the city managers and uh, city administrator of Federal Way, uh, Brian Wilson from Burien, myself, and uh, several representatives from the airport, and actually included the other three cities that had not withdrawn, which was Tukwila, SeaTac, and Normandy Park. So we all met again. Thanks. We, we met at that meeting and we walked through, and I will discuss this more on the 12th, we walked through the issues that were associated with kind of outstanding problems with the start. And there were a number of them, and Brian Wilson has done a great summary, which I'll share with council when we come back to this discussion. I think, Steve, you were involved um, quite a bit in helping to articulate what those were. Um, and that came out of the meeting that we had in November, the joint meeting. So um, where we are is that other cities, including Burien and Federal Way, are currently holding similar briefings to this and will be making decisions with their councils as to what their future role in, in START will be. Um, I think that one, one thing notable about the motion from our council about moving forward was direction from the mayor and myself with, with a significant amount of flexibility in terms of what those negotiations would look like. I think other cities, at least I know Burien was a little more specific of, of things being addressed, but there are some, there are some, I would say, glimmers of hope. And I think that one of the things that, that we talked about was having a steering committee, possibly, if the city were to rejoin START, that we'd be part of a steering committee. City managers would meet before the START meetings with Lance Little, work through the agenda, work through the briefing packet, because that was always an issue, that we didn't see the materials until, until late. And, and so that was a, you know, sort of port-driven process, but, you know, we wanted to be like advised of what was going to be discussed. And there are a number of other outstanding issues. But um, what I'm hoping to do is have more comprehensive presentation to you um, on March 12th. And hopefully council can decide the right course for the city relative to the start. Thank you. And that concludes our. Thank you. Will the clerk please read the consent calendar? Item one, approval of vouchers. Item two, approval of minutes. Item three, DSHS interlocal data share agreement. Item four, draft ordinance 20-016, increasing impressed cash funds. Item five, interfund loan for the purchase of in-car dashboard camera systems. Item six, public defense service contract assignment and extension. Item seven, interagency agreement with Highline College for the Small Business Development Center. And item eight, draft ordinance number 20-013, establishing a custodial fund and an affordable housing sales tax fund in Title III. And that concludes the consent calendar, Mayor. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Motion was made by Councilmember Nutting, seconded by Councilmember Bangs. Anything Councilmember wishes to remove? Seeing nothing, all in favor of the consent, is any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the consent calendar, please raise your right hand and say aye. 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 Passes 6 0. And that puts us at the end of our meeting. Our next meeting will be March 12, 2020. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion was made by Councilmember Nutting, seconded by Councilmember Bangs. All those in favor, please raise your right hand and say aye. 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 Passes 6 0. We are adjourned.